Hi, guys. So the answer is no. Thanks. <laughs> uh, OK, so today I would like to talk with you about the JWT tokens. Who knows what's a JWT token? Good. And uh, our, let's say, approach to use them instead of session cookies. Uh, I would like to show you some of the drawbacks of this solution, some of the gains of this solution, and how we ended up using them. So maybe let's start with something really, really obvious, the old cookie-based session. Uh, I guess everybody knows how it works, but just set the ground. Uh, client makes, makes, makes a request to the server. Server creates some file on a hard drive, at least in the default setup with some uh, user-associated information, and this uses back an ID for the session as a, in a cookie. And once the client makes another request, the cookie is there, and we can identify the guy. Uh, some of the obvious features that we take for granted for a session, it's kept server-side. That's, let's say, a drawback. It's easily accessible to us. It expires automatically once the user leaves the page, so we don't have to care about the junk data. Also, it's extended if the user stays on a page for a really long time, so we don't have to bother uh, with a case that it will suddenly expire in the middle of his visit. Uh, also, because it's sent in a cookie, all the modern browsers support special flags called secure and HTTP only. The first one prevents the browser from sending it through an unencrypted channel, so prevents any man in the middle attacks. The second flag pretend, uh, pre prevents it being written, written from JavaScript. This, pre uh, this prevents any XSS kind of attacks. Now, session ID is simply some ID, some random string that is hard to guess. But we can imagine, why are we sending this idea at all? Why can't we just send some data there and more to be able to, to be sure that this data is safe? And here we come to the idea of JSON Web Token, which consists of three parts. It's a string that you see on the left there, and uh, this is the way you see them in the wild. Um, it's base64 encoded, so once you decode it, you will see a JSON for a header, for a payload, and for a signature. What makes the token interesting are the payload and the signature parts. In the payload, there are some predefined fields that are usually optional, but they are predefined. They say when a token was created, how, for how long it's valid. But you can also put any custom data there. Anything you wish to put here, for example, user ID. Uh, the second thing that makes this payload interesting is the signature that ensures it's not easy to play with this payload, for example, change something there. Uh, if you are using asymmetric encryption keys to create a signature, then the person holding the private key creates the content and signs it, and anyone knowing the public key can check, first of all, whether it has been signed by the person knowing the pr private key, second of all, you can be almost absolutely sure it has not been played around, so it cannot be modified. Now imagine instead of sending this session ID, you are just sending the token there. And that's it, the only change. Once you are sending a JWT token to a client, for example, the same way you would send a session ID in a cookie, then all your data is already in this token. You don't have to store anything on the server side. It's on the client once he makes another request. You just read the contents of the token. You don't have to refer to any, I don't know, Redis database or, or hard drive. And, uh, and you have your data there. And you can trust it because it's encrypted, it, it's been signed. Looks really cool. So for example, if you uh, store some variable that will change with time, you just send the value of one to the client once he wishes to change it. You just, instead of storing it locally, you send it back to the client to just create a new token. Sounds cool. So if you will go to an average JWT tokens are awesome page, you will see those selling points. So 
you can store your custom data there. You don't have to store anything on the server side. You don't need additional dat database calls for checking the session or, or other stuff session related. And what's more, anyone with the public key can, can check whether data, your data is valid. Uh, even there is a standard JWE that's less known where you can encrypt your data and then nobody will be able to read what's in there. Now, OAuth 2.0. Who has implemented anything OAuth 2.0 related? Great. Who has implemented the server or at least used ready implementation? Not so many. Okay, great. So maybe this is obvious, uh, but of 2.0 has a few flows. One of the most known one is so-called authorization code or authorization grant flow, where the user provides the authorization grant to some application called the client, and this application can get access to some additional resources. A major advantage of of 2.0 is the fact that the user never reviews the password to any external application. There's only one place that knows his password. What's less known is the fact that there are many other flows. So the first one, most known authorization code one, is the one not to reveal the password but, but give access to some third entity. But there's the also using user credentials flow that's very similar to standard sign-in where you provide your username and password. There's also client credentials flow where the application itself without the participation of the user can authorize itself and a few others. For example, the user credentials flow, you go to some external application, that's usually a native application because this is where it applies. You just provide user, your username and password, the application sends this username and password together with its own credentials and receives a token. The drawback of this flow is that this application has seen your password. That's why it's useful for, I don't know, n your native application that you trust. Uh, implementing it. It might sound difficult, but actually it's extremely simple. You just can use one of the ready implementations. Let's say the most popular is the one from the, the PHP League, where you have to spend some time telling it where to store the data for the tokens, for the user credentials, etc. Then you just set up the server, configure it, and what's not in the screen, you, you define the endpoints to obtain the token, to authorize, etc. Now, basically, you can set it up in one day unless you want something highly custom. Now, the problems. So, let's say I'm using OAuth 2.0. I'm using JWT token, so I'm no longer using session. And we immediately fall into problems of the things that were granted. So, for example, let's start to think that the user is sitting on a page for a long time. Token is only valid, let's say, for an hour. What if uh, he sits for a longer period on that page? So we come to a problem of extending this token somehow. For a cookie, it's granted. For a session ID, cookie is granted. For a token? Well, according to OAuth, you need yet another token. That's called refresh token. And it's valid for much longer. You can use it to obtain new access tokens. And it's meant to be a bit safer, although it's valid for longer, because you, you don't use it on a day-to-day -day communication. So when you authorize, you receive access token and refresh token, the B point there. Then you only use the access token to get your data. Once it expires, you have to implement yet another flow to use this refresh token to obtain a new access token. And then continue your business as usual stuff. What's really not cool about this fact, this solution, is the client implementation becomes much more complex. And we want the client implementation to be as simple as possible. Not only you have to implement this give me the access token flow, you have to implement this use refresh token to get a new access token flow. And even worse, those FGH points are usually not so easy to test. Imagine you have just written your code for F, G, and H, and now you have to wait for one hour for your token to expire to test the situation in life. 
not cool. <coughs> so let's look at the big guys, how Facebook or Twitter does this. Neither of them do, let's say, all by the book, but they do something off like. And apparently, for example, Twitter resigned from uh, expiring the tokens at all. They, they are valid forever unless somebody decides to invalidate them on purpose. Facebook uh, also didn't implement this refresh token flow. They just allow you to get your short-term token and immediately exchange it to a long-term one. And I suspect the reason for those solutions is that they really didn't want all the developers in the world to worry about this refresh token flow. Uh, security concerns. Hello there. <laughs> uh, so let's start with something obvious. Let's think hacker tries to make his own cookie, session ID, or a token. So the safety of the session ID is based on the fact that it's a hard to guess random string. And let's say we hope it has been proven for many years. JWT token uh, safety is based on the fact that it's very difficult to create one on your own and you cannot modify it due to the signature. But what when hacker tries to steal a session cookie or a token? For a session cookie, those are the flags that we mentioned that make it rather safe. If you use them, you should feel rather safe. JavaScript won't steal it. Uh, also, sniffing the traffic won't steal it. But for a token? Well, according to OAuth, it should be sent in a header. If it's meant to be sent in a header, then any web application has to have JavaScript that will actually read it and send it and add it to the header. It means you are immediately vulnerable to XSS kind of attacks. So there's, for example, we had an idea. Why not to send it in a header? Let's send it in a cookie and add those flags. But then we immediately have fallen into the problem. Of what about those refresh tokens? Should we send our refresh token JavaScript accessible? If we did it, it would be equally as bad as giving it access to access token. So even OVASP has spotted this issue and there are recommendations for it. They say to store it in session storage, to send it in, he in headers according to, to what OAuth suggests. And they are telling us to do some finger fingerprint magic. So what's this fingerprint stuff? Well, basically, it's a cookie. And it's a cookie holding some random string. And in the token, there's a hash of this random string. It means you can steal the, to still steal the token, but when you try to use it, you won't have the fingerprint that's sent through the cookie. And the server that's authorizing you will be checking for both. And if one is missing, token is simply useless. Alternatively, they say to, to just send the tokens in the cookies. Uh, token invalidation stuff. So for a session, you just can delete all user-related sessions. You can delete this session or reset, reset this session. It's very easy. For a token, well, if you have sent it already to the wild and you are not checking it against anything on your server side, then only the expiry date is, is the information you can have. It means you cannot invalidate a session token, uh, a token immediately, unless you stop uh, stop relying on the expiry date and you actually have some server-side storage. It means if you are to back to square one of having simply a session. <coughs> so let's go back to this average JWT tokens at our awesome page. I'm not saying they're not, but I'm saying some of their points are at least doubtful. So there is a place for custom data. Yes, as long as you as a server can easily issue new tokens on the fly. If it's a separate like OAuth authority, then you cannot do it. Uh, you don't need to store it on the server side. Yes, if you are happy with the fact that you cannot invalidate it, you have to wait for it to expire. And, well, no need for additional DB call or hard drive call, see the points above. Also, if you decide the solution, you have to care about 
at least part of your session implementation. You have to do it on your own. How did we do it in one of our projects? So, first of all, we started with, let's say, a, let's say honestly, a crappy front-end service that was render me whole page application and was using session cookies. Behind it, that was, let's say, the cool part of the project, we find this front-end service, there were actual services. I wouldn't say microservices, but certainly service-based applications. Uh, and one day business came to us and they said, well, we have already this front-end, now we want to have fully functional mobile applications for our users. And we said, okay, we need to change this crappy front-end, do an API, uh, rewrite the front end because there will be an API, implement authorization flows, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And they said, in two months. And just to tell you the scale, we have when we finished, there were over 120 endpoints in this API. So a lot of cursing happened, a lot of laughing happened. And what was even more funny, uh, they already hired the guys that are going to do a mobile application. They are starting in two weeks. And we have no, no single endpoint. <laughs> uh, eventually, we ended up having first endpoints two weeks later. The guys doing mobile promised they will do it in two months. We had all our endpoints ready in something like four months. Our front end was rewritten to Angular in six months. And mobile guys spent over eight months doing this application. <coughs> What we ended up with was native Angular-based web client, native mobile applications, and we are ready for future external clients. We got rid of this crappy front-end service entirely, introduced new API service and a few other externally accessible services. Now, because this talk is about OAuth and JWT, let's focus on this part. Uh, clients simply make sign-in requests receive the tokens, send the tokens back. All externally accessible services do basic token checks. And the authentication or authorization service is the only one that can issue tokens and has at least access to this private key. And we also had to meet those, those additional demands I was mentioning. Uh, so basically not everything was, let's say, so, so pink and shiny. Uh, first of all, we really didn't like the fact of, fact of XSS being possible, even though we had a more modern Angular-based application. So we decided to send the tokens as cookies, both the access and the refresh tokens. The drawback was that the refresh token was not sent by the book, it was sent on every request. Uh, what was the upside of this is that uh, once the once the token uh, got invalidated, the client would seamlessly receive a new one. Uh, so remember me option. This was uh, something we didn't expect. So since you are sending the token in a cookie, token has its own expiry date and the cookie has its own expiry date. So for example, if the user chosen not to remember himself for the next visit, uh, we had to match the length of the cookies with the length of the tokens. And in the first scenario, both are valid as long as the browser window is open. In the second scenario, the refresh token is valid for much longer. And because they were sent in the cookie, Angular had no idea whether they didn't know even of their existence. And uh, once the access token got expired, but refresh token was still valid, then API would seamlessly contact uh, the, the authorization service and then issue new tokens back to client, and they will be then sent as cookies to the client. Uh, then we had to cover this invalidate token scenarios because it was not enough for us to wait for the tokens to expire. We wanted in the future to have a log me out of all applications immediately button. And as I said earlier, there's no solution to this except storing something on server storage. So we did this 
you will call it anti-pattern. I will also call it anti-pattern of sharing Redis database between API service and other services and authentication service, etc. cetera. Uh, to minimize why we did it for speed, because it was happening in each and every request. And uh, to minimize this effect, we just implemented SDKs so that at least the database is hidden between behind some library. Uh, so exemplary possible happy flows. A request comes in. The token is checked against uh, Redis database whether it's still valid, as in a session scenario. If it's valid, then we proceed. If the token in access token is expired or missing, then we go to authorization service for a new token that authorization service does some additional checks and issues a new token that we send back to the client. Okay, so what did we gain with OAuth 2.0? Um, many clients can access our API, similarly to Facebook or, or Twitter. We have only one place where passwords are stored and only one place where they are being sent, the sign -on, single si sign-on scenario. Uh, also, passwords never leak anywhere, hopefully. And uh, we can even then in the future control which application can do what. Uh, what did we gain with JWT tokens? Uh, well, this private key-based signature ensures only one thing can issue them. Uh, and we could actually store some data there that never changes, for example, the user ID. And if you are thinking of a render whole page application, this might be useless. But for us, the fact that uh, it was already there was very useful for those small API endpoints where we didn't have to contact for further details. <coughs> uh, just one ending remark. If you are thinking of doing, for example, simply a sin single sign-on scenario, don't go with usage of all those tokens. Just obtain the token, and within your application, once the user has been signed on with this external identity, just proceed with the session. It will be much easier for you. Okay, thank you very much. Any questions? Anyone? Over there? <laughs> um, I was wondering about the performance implications. You were showing that you are still going to do a lot of server-side I.O. And my reason for implementing uh, sessions as a token was mostly getting rid of that I.O., getting rid of problems like sticky sessions, getting problems like um, having to replicate the tokens across storage as server side. Whereas if I keep them on the client side, which may be a bit stretched, it actually removes those problems for the 80-20 scenario because I don't have scenarios like logging out a user forcefully everywhere. Um, I'm not sure if I understand your question. So we had to actually check something on the server side because we could no longer trust the expiry date of the token that has been already sent. If it's signed, then you don't need to do storage lookups. That's what I'm yeah, saying. Exactly. If it's fine, you don't need to do the storage lookup and then you then have those gains of uh, actually not reading your storage. Do, do you have any number, like how much faster or slower that is? For me, it's it was 40 times faster. <laughs> uh, honestly, I don't know or don't remember. <laughs> Anyone? Just maybe as a simple answer to this talk, the way I see it, uh, go ahead and it's a good idea to just, for example, replace this as a session cookie unless you are aware of the implications. Like, for example, you no longer, it's not easy to invalidate it, for example. Okay, thanks. <laughs> <laughs>